Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very excited today to uh, introduce our speaker in the DEC lecture series. Uh, this lecture series started back in January uh, and has uh, has generated at least two chief economists of major international institutions. So <laughs> uh, uh, I see it as a, a, a shadow recruitment uh, exercise. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a great series. And I'm uh, delighted that, uh, as many of you know, we, we're going to go through May of next year. Uh, we've already got several of the speakers lined up. But today, I'm exceptionally happy to introduce Alice Evans. I was trying to think of how to describe Alice. And the, the word that came to my mind is, she's a phenomenon. Um, you know, on the one hand, she works on compelling issues, you know, the power of ideas, you know, <laughs> uh, or inequality, or social norms, and, and, and uh, decent work, value change. These are like the big issues confronting us today. But I think the other part about Alice is the way she works, because she's almost the antithesis of a of a British professor sitting in a sitting in a remote uh, office doing her calculations and then emerging with a paper every every year or so. She is constantly engaging with everybody, including many of the people in this room. I see um, uh, on her research and absorbing ideas, throwing them out there in preliminary form. Getting, uh, getting into debates uh, and uh, everything else. And then at the same time, Alice is actually one of the most generous people I see uh, in, the, in, the, in the profession. I mean, so when she engages, she also is, is, is supporting you with, uh, with your work. She, and just let me mention one other thing. She reviews every world development report <laughs> on the day it is published. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> including <laughs> this latest one. Uh, <laughs> I won't say what she said, but <laughs> uh, 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 but that takes uh, uh, that that takes quite a lot of uh, courage and um, uh, stamina, <laughs> I would say. Uh, and uh, she's also very generous with her compliments. And I, I just want to quote one thing. So she was very excited about our. Uh, uh, SDG Atlas that we published last fall, and actually, <laughs> you appreciate the Atlas a lot more if you read her her, her Twitter uh, uh, thread, uh, which picked out uh, certain graphs in the Atlas and showed how we were using different techniques. I, d I didn't even know about some of those things, even though I'm supposed to be supervising this. Um, and uh, at one point, there were some new graphs I don't know if there's anybody from the data group here, but there's a new graph, and at some one point, Alice goes, these World Bank kids are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's the closest uh, our colleagues will get to be likened to Bruce Springsteen or something. But uh, anyway, so all, with all of that, I am just so happy that uh, Alice is able to come and spend some time with us, and she will talk about politicizing inequality and the power of ideas. So, Alice. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. So I see income inequality as one of the greatest challenges of our time. And to understand, how is it be? Damn it. Ah, we're on, sorry. Right, resume monologue. Right, to understand how to tackle income inequality, what I suggest we do is two things. One is to learn from progress study places in the world where income inequality has fallen and try to understand why that's happened. Specifically, I think we need to understand people's reasons for acting, how they came to challenge inequalities. So for that, to that end, we need to draw on social psychology and anthropology, but also connect that micro to the macro, connecting it to economics and political science. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is look at why income inequality fell in Latin America over the 2000s. And I'll be drawing on social psychology, anthropology, then connecting it to uh, macroeconomics and political science. That's the plan, anyway. But before we kick off, before we start talking about wonderful things about income inequality falling, I want to think about the reasons why income inequality may persist. What people's stereotypes, their beliefs, their assumptions about the world, both of elites and indigenous groups. 
So if you would please turn to your neighbour and think of why people's beliefs might lead them to go along with inequalities in Latin America. Smile sweetly. Turn to your neighbour. One minute. Which, which World Bank kid is on fire and could uh, give us some suggestions about how beliefs could perpetuate inequalities, how people's stereotypes or assumptions might lead them to go along with inequalities? Maybe I'll pick on Varun. Absolutely. So our stereotypes are, are assumptions about someone because they're a member of a particular group. We, if we regard in, in Latin America, for example, indigenous people are often regarded as savages, as backward, as less knowledgeable. And those stereotypes are developed through observation of labor markets, media, and politics. If you only ever see white men in prestigious, socially valued domains, then you assume that they are naturally more competent, naturally better leaders. In fact, it would be risky to vote for an indigenous person because you've never seen whether they can succeed in that role. And those stereotypes are perpetuated through media. Uh, you know, for, in Latin America, most of the news readers are white men. So perpetuating ideas about who is a knowledgeable authority. And these stereotypes are subject to confirmation bias. So once we already assume a belief, thinking that indigenous groups are less knowledgeable, less deserving of status, it's really difficult to dislodge that idea. Uh, we pay more attention to beliefs that fit with what we already know. And these beliefs can curb redistribution. So for example, in Santa Cruz in Bolivia, because white elites did not identify with the other, they always push for autonomy to prevent redistribution of their assets towards the other. Our stereotypes of who is knowledgeable uh, may also curb support for participatory governance initiatives. And even if there is a participatory governance initiative, for example, in 2004, Bolivia introduced the law of popular participation. But the white liberal elites were reluctant to listen to indigenous groups because they assumed that they knew best. They'd been to school, they were educated, these other people did not know. So their stereotypes shaped what was possible through that institutionalized participatory forum. Another kind of belief that can perpetuate inequalities is socially constructed ideas of difference. So for example, in Bolivia again, before the 1980s, Lowland and Highland uh, ethnic groups did not necessarily identify as indigenous. And that curved horizontal association, you know, a sort of nationwide collective movement of indigenous people, those socially constructed ideas of difference. And those were reinforced by geography. You know, if transport is difficult, if there are poor communications, you don't mix, you don't mingle, you don't interact together, then you may not see that other ethnic group as somehow alike. We can also go along with inequalities if we take them for granted, if we don't question them. So if black and indigenous groups are habituated to hierarchy, used to routine degrading treatment, always retold of their, their worthlessness, their inferiority, they may come to take that for granted. Uh, Nancy Postero, uh, an anthropologist, has highlighted in Bolivia how indigenous groups to, regarded uh, education as a privilege, not as a right. So if we don't question the status quo distribution, if we don't question that inequality, we may not push for better government services. We may not demand more of government. We may not demand for better educational services. We don't push for accountability. Even if there's a strong self-interested reason for it, our beliefs may, may impede that. So if we're not exposed to alternatives, we're less likely to question these beliefs. And this can be reinforced by dynamics at the individual level and also the sort of institutional national level. 
So, for example, Andrea Cornwall, a brilliant anthropologist, highlights the story of Croesa Oliveira, a black domestic worker who worked from the age of 10 till 21, never being paid. You know, physically abused, verbally harassed, long, long days, but not really questioning, just ex despondently accepting that as her fate. Because she never saw alternative discourses, never saw the critique of that kind of lifestyle. So she just sort of fatalistically accepted. We also see this as more common if women are housebound with a huge volume of care work, multiple children, you know, less exposed, you not know, meeting and mingling and going to collective gatherings, but staying by themselves. Or also uh, rural isolation. If people are living in a remote village, never, seeing criti never hearing critical discourses or seeing strikes, protests, they may come to accept it because they haven't been exposed to alternatives. That lack of critique can also be impeded by nationwide political dynamics. For example, in an authoritarian country, as in Latin America over the 1970s, it became you know, incredibly dangerous, risky to speak out. So if people aren't speaking out, you may not be aware of that kind of critique. These kinds of assumptions, acceptance of the status quo, also leads elites to perpetuate inequalities. So, for example, Wendy Wolford has done brilliant research in uh, Brazil, in Santa Carina, how the agrarian elites regarded the existing land distribution as just. So, you know, Brazil, as we all know, famously unequal, right? But they had worked hard for their land, they bought it fairly and squarely, and so they regarded the existing distribution as fair. And they saw these, this MST, this landless people's movement pushing for redistribution, as them being lazy, them asking for something for nothing, whereas the elites felt righteously entitled to their land. So our, our beliefs can lead us to be more dismissive of alternatives, be less too dismissive of, of calls for redistribution. So those are all examples of what Varun would call personal beliefs, our internalised ideologies, things that we accept. There's another kind of belief that can also perpetuate inequalities. And those are our expectations, our norm perceptions, our beliefs about how the government will respond and how our peers will respond. So, for example, if people never see successful strikes, they may become despondent, as occurred in Peru in the early, early 1990s. They assumed that workers' organisation not, would not be able to secure changes in labour legislation or in terms of minimum wages. So they became more despondent and they become less likely to mobilise for reform. So these norm perceptions, like all other kinds of beliefs, are reinforced by our observation of the world. If people, never see, if people do not see the government being responsive, tolerant, capable or non-violent, they lower their expectations of what government might do and are less likely to invest in reforms. So this creates a sense of de uh, despondency, reducing likelihood to mobilise. And again, like other beliefs, these are reinforced by labour market structures and political structures. So in an authoritarian environment, we can get what we call pluralistic ignorance. That everyone might be privately critical of the authoritarian state, but because they observe everyone else complying, they assume everyone else is okay with it. So they personally don't want to risk speaking out because of the risk. So what you get there is a huge coordination problem in that no one thinks it's OK, but they don't realise widespread dissatisfaction and frustration. And for that reason, they're less likely to mobilise. So what we have here is what observation of widespread behaviour affects people's beliefs, their norm perceptions, and then their behaviour does not change because of the huge cost of unilateral deviation. So, for example, if men think that other men will mock them for sharing care work, if men think that if they go on paternity leave that other men will mock them, then they might be reluctant to do it themselves because they don't want to be ridiculed. Or, for instance, if you think that workers won't rise with you when you go out on strike, you will be reluctant to do it too. So people only change their expectations, their norm perceptions, when they observe widespread behavioural change. But that behavioural change is unlikely, right? So what we have here is a chicken and egg problem. For the beliefs to change, they need to observe a change in behaviour. 
But that behavioural change doesn't happen because the norm perceptions stay constant. That, I think, is our, our really big challenge. Let me give one more example of that. Domestic workers. Domestic workers, uh, the ethnographic research from the 1970s, 1980s, suggests that they did not expect labour regulators to take their concerns seriously. They assumed that if they went to the government, if they went to reports that their employer, their patrono, does not uh, pay a certain wage, does not, do any, does not you know, give them a Sunday off, they, didn't assume, they thought the government wouldn't do anything about it. So if you don't anticipate a responsive government, then you don't push for accountability. So that curbs pressures for reform. And we get trapped in a path-dependent status quo, inhibiting political change. So that's the depressing part of the talk over. <laughs> right. So now I'm going to present some descriptive data about the fall in income inequality in Latin America. So over the... Oh, do you guys not have laser beams? Ah. Okay, I was expecting a laser. Sorry, I'm just pointing. Anyway, imagine I have a powerful laser. So over the 1990s, income inequality increased and then fell over the 2000s. So here's, obviously, there's huge variation within the region, um, which you won't be able to make out there. But should you want to look at it, it's our, our world in data. I think this, this uh, World Bank graph puts it very nicely, that we see a much, fuller, a much larger decrease in income inequality in, the, uh, in countries with a commodity boom. So why might this be? Well, first, I want to distinguish between two forms of inequality, uh, labour income inequality and non-labour income inequality. Labour income inequality fell, uh, particularly in Brazil, the Southern Cone and the Andes. Uh, wages grew in all sectors for all types of employment, but especially for the poorest, especially for the least skilled workers. And that partly reflects education, Dave, uh, and, but also it reflects a growing demand for unskilled work in the context of the commodity boom, as well as increased enforcement of labour legislation in Brazil and Argentina especially, and also hikes in the minimum wage. Uh, across the road at the IMF, there's a nice paper by Alvarez highlighting the role that minimum wage increases played in reducing income inequality in Latin America. Also, we see wage, uh, minimum wage hikes being very important in Panama, in Nicaragua, and in Argentina. So that's the fall in labor income inequality. Also important was redistribution. Governments increasingly spending on social protection, cash transfers, but also health and education, increasing coverage, but also quality. OK, so those are two issues a fall in labour income inequality and also non-labour income inequality. Put your hand up if you think that the fall in labour income inequality was the most important for the fall in overall income inequality. Which was more labour income? Hands up for labour income inequality. Okay, hands down. Hands up for if you think it was all about the redistribution, the cash transfers. Okay, so it, it varies which country we're talking about, but overall it was prim pre predominantly the labour income inequality that was really important. So, but now I, I want to add a caveat here. What we see then is that income inequality fell because the proceeds of growth became more evenly, more fairly shared across the population. So we do not see a radical large-scale redistribution of land. We do not see a big change in the progressiveness of the tax structure. So the fundamentals of inequality are still there. So these gains in inequality become con contingent upon continued economic growth. So there's a sense of fragility there. It's about redistributing the fiscal surplus. It's about workers gaining more because of an increased demand for unskilled labour. But that growth was itself fragile. Because over the 2000s, we did not see a big change in macroeconomic structure, improved industrial policy, improved productivity, increased private investment. So both the redistribution and the growth were fragile, hence what we've seen in the past couple of years. So now we have the fun question, right? Why is it that these governments redistributed? Why did they increase the minimum wages? Now here's our fun puzzle. I think there are three hypotheses which again, we'll have a little vote on. One, increased fiscal space. 
governments having more money, more able to share some of it around. I guess that's a sort of fairly technocratic, technical explanation. Another hypothesis, which I think is also plausible, is democratization or accountability to the poor majority. Option three, social movements, politicizing inequality. So let's take a vote again. Who's going to vote? Now, clearly there are no monocausal explanations. There may also be synergies and interactions. But who thinks that increased fiscal space was the major driver of the fall in, in income inequality? Hands up for fiscal space. OK. Hands up for democratization. Three social movements. OK. okay. Well, let's first let, let's discuss each of these hypotheses in turn. So increased fiscal space. I think that's really plausible because over the 1980s and 1990s, the la many Latin American countries experienced inflationary crises. They had credit restrictions, experienced capital flight. Uh, there were debt relief conditionalities from right here and also the IMF. Um, and the, that, all, the, all that curbs the room for maneuver. You know, in context of inflation, be less likely to redistribute. Then over the 2000s, the fiscal space increased with the commodity boom after 2003, with increased overseas development assistance associated with the uh, Millennium Development Goals, but also improved terms of trade, improved tax to GDP ratio, making it easier for governments to redistribute, right? Uh, but, but I don't want to generalize about all Latin American countries here because the oil importing countries of Central America experienced a trade deficit as oil prices increased. Okay, so there are reasons for thinking that maybe increased fiscal space was a necessary condition for increased redistribution because in enabling governments to govern on the left. So, for example, even Chavez, when he was first elected before the commodity boom, he did not massively increase social spending. He only increased social spending after the commodity boom. Likewise, Morales, he, the, um, when gas prices fell, he, he cut gas subsidies. Sim similarly, uh, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, when, uh, with, uh, after the commodity boom in 2014, she introduced measures of austerity. So where even these leftist governments change their spending in response to the commodity boom. So there's reasons to think that increased fiscal space was a necessary condition. But I don't think it was a sufficient condition. Because why did the wealthy countries like Chile not redistribute more? And in fact, in some countries like Brazil, increased redistribution preceded the commodity boom. And also, I think if we look around the world at other regions, we realize that even when there are countries that experience a commodity boom that are mineral and oil rich, we don't see a fall in income inequality. So, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, the countries where there is the, where the mineral and oil wealth actually saw an increase in income inequality over the 2000s because governments chose to enrich themselves and their peers rather than redistribute to the poor majority. So something else is happening in Latin America. So democratization. I think again that's pretty plausible. And I think here, here let me offer three hypotheses why democratization might make a difference to income inequality. One is under the military regimes when there was huge repression, brutal crackdowns against leftist organizing, it's a pretty strong opportunity cost to going out protesting. But with increased multipartyism, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, there's a reduced opportunity cost for going out, mobilizing, pushing for greater accountability. A second issue is in a multi-party context, where political parties are competing to stay in power, they have an incentive to court the poor majority, you know, respond to poor people, offer them redistribution, and stay in power, right? Sort of rational choice explanation. We also might think that in countries with a large indigenous population, if you have multi-partyism, they would be more responsive to that large indigenous population. The institutional reforms associated with democratization might also lower the cost of entry for new parties, like indigenous parties. I think those are all plausible hypotheses. But, and I find this pretty weird, 
Asimoglu and Robinson in their Asimoglu and others in their 2015 paper find no association between democratization and a fall in income inequality. Likewise, looking at Latin America, Tenorio finds that democratization does not increase social spending. And even though we might think that in a country with a large poor or indigenous majority, indigenous population, you'd find a bigger indigenous party, that's not the case at all. Even if democratization enables the formation of indigenous parties, it doesn't guarantee they'll be successful. So in Peru, in Guatemala, where there are large indigenous populations, they do not have successful indigenous parties. We also know from looking at social survey data that the poorest don't necessarily vote for left-wing parties. So this sort of rational choice explanation that democratization of more inclusive institutions will enable more, a more inclusive economy and a fall in income inequality doesn't seem to hold up if we look at cross-sectional data. But Buber and Stevens have this really nice study looking over the long term. And they find lagged effects. So 20 years of democratization does seem to be associated with increased social spending and with a fall in income inequality. So it's like on day one, democracy doesn't lead to a, sh a shift in people's preferences. But over the long term, maybe democratization enables something else that is important. Which leads me on to act three, social movements. So. I think that, so first of all, I'm going to look at the quantitative data, and then we're going to think about the ethnographic data. So there is, the quantitative data suggests that we see a fall in uh, wage inequality in context with union activism. I think Nora Lustig has shown that. Also, between uh, 1970 and 2007, there seems to be a, a lagged effect of union activism. And that's associated with increased social spending, uh, finds Tenorio. Interestingly, democratization only increases social spending if there are organized labor protests. That's another finding from Tenorio. So it seems that uh, we also know, looking at indigenous parties, that indigenous parties perform better in countries where there is a strong nationally organized indigenous social movement. So in Peru, where the indigenous movements are fragmented, no strong indigenous parties. But if you have a nationwide strong indigenous social movement, then those political parties form much better, even in countries with minuscule indigenous populations like Venezuela or Colombia. Now, how can we explain this? Well, how can we explain this association between activism and inequality? On the one hand, we might explain it in terms of opportunity costs and people's economic self-interest. So, for example, uh, with economic liberalization, wage cuts, privatization, job losses. That stimulated uh, a rise in activism and food riots across the region because people saw this sudden threat to their incomes and so they quickly mobilized. You know, they didn't have a change in beliefs. They didn't suddenly become more critical of inequality. There was a sudden threat to their incomes and so they mobilized against that. Uh, opportunity costs and economic self-interest can also explain the state's response. So, for example, when uh, indigenous groups closed the Pan American Highway in Colombia, the state quickly responded to their demands. I just spat there, but it didn't hit you. You're fine. Um, the state quickly responded to their demands, right? Because they'd stymied the economy, they'd stalled public transport. So it's partly about self interest, partly about opportunity cost. But I don't think that self interested explanation explains why protests grow over time, why social movements become bigger, even while the economy stays fairly similar. Right? So, to, hit, to explain why protests grow over time and why indigenous parties expand, I think we need to think about beliefs and how social movements can change the stigma of black or indigenous people's identities and how they might generate solidarity and shift expectations about what peers will do and how the governments will respond. So if you remember, at the beginning of our talk, I highlighted how indigenous people or black people might comply with inequalities, or no, not comply, might go along with things 
due to being habituated to centuries of oppression, uh, degrading, dehumanizing treatment, and that stigmatized identity. Well, social movements here were key across Latin America, but particularly in Bolivia, Ecuador, through collective kitchens, through popular fiestas, through celebrating and affirming indigenous identities, and through venerating past heroes who rebelled against oppression and rekindling a pride in their indigenous identities. And actually, over the 2000s, the proportion of people in Bolivia identifying as indigenous actually increased by rekindling that pride. That proud self-identity made people more likely to mobilize. So through the gathering, through hearing critical discourses, people became more likely to question the status quo. So earlier, I gave the example of Cruza Oliveira, the black domestic worker who was not paid for her work. Well, one day on the radio, she heard people talking about human rights and the idea that domestic workers might be entitled to a day off. So she went to gather with them at a church one Sunday, and she met other domestic workers who were also criticizing the status quo, who were calling for a change in their labor conditions. And she kept gathering with them, and she kept hearing all these critical discourses. And one day, and this is all detailed by the wonderful Andrea Cornwell, and one day she came to see so many domestic workers gathering, critiquing the state, they became more confident of the possibility of political change. Croesa Oliveira then became president of the uh, Domestic Workers Federation in Brazil, and this year, in 2018, Brazil ratified the ILO Convention on Domestic Workers and has increasingly pushed for various legislative reforms. So it's this process of through gathering together, through hearing people critique the status quo, that people might become more critical. We can also see how in Argentina, for example, destabilizing historic patron-client relationships like unemployed workers gathering at roadblocks, not relying on a patron, a patron intermediary to negotiate with state authorities on their behalf, but doing it themselves at the roadblocks, and then gaining a sense of pride and a sense of accomplishment and increased confidence in their movement through, through, through these successes. Um, another example, again in Argentina, is with Argentina's debt crisis in 2001, unemployed workers seized their factories and they had this uh, slogan, occupy, produce, resist. And through doing it for themselves, through forming successful cooperatives, they became more confident of their cap capacity to do this. So continue to mobilize, continue to push for change. So you see now how we see this opportunity cost triggers mobilization, and that process of mobilization can cause a sort of ideational change in beliefs and people becoming more critical, more, more likely to question the status quo. So there's a synergy. Um, for, and we also see this synergy really plays out with urban-rural differences. So anti we know from quantitative evidence that anti-austerity riots were much more pervasive in cities. And that partly relates to opportunity costs, you know, cuts to formal employment, wage cuts, job losses, and the high cost of living in cities. So that triggered people to go out and march. But then, in cities, due to the heterogeneity, the density, the propinquity, you're much more likely to see these critical street arts. You're much more likely to see strikes, protests. You're hearing of critical discourses on community radio. So seeing all that, realizing these possibilities, stimulates greater critique and greater calls for reform. Whereas, by contrast, in remote rural regions with less connectivity, less links to what's going on in cities, less hopeful, more despondent, not realizing that life could be different, so more likely to accept that status quo. So there are synergies between ideas and interests there relating to mobilization. And these critical discourses can also be intensified by media. So, for example, it was widespread media criticism of Cardoso's social policy that led to a reform and the introduction of Bolsa Escolar. Uh, critical discourses through the media are important in showing widespread critique. Again, shifting our norm perceptions, realizing that other people are also critical, that other people are also frustrated. 
building people's uh, hopes and confidence in, in possible change. But, but mobilization and media is not enough. What's really important, what we see through the ethnographic research, is responsive governance and successful mobilization. When people see that organizing together, then they can gain something from the government, then they become even more hopeful, more likely to invest. So for example, in Colombia, in Ecuador, and Venezuela, through the constitutional reform process, indigenous representatives were elected to various assemblies. And seeing that the state was responsive, seeing that the state would facilitate their representation, in each of those countries, indigenous people's movements coalesced into political parties because they saw that the political arena was open to them. Similarly, in Brazil, which had a remarkably participatory constitutional making process with sort of meetings up and down the country, that raised people's hopes of a more socially inclusive government. So shifting people's expectations of what government might do. Unions and cooperatives were also emboldened by a more responsive governance. Another example, after Morales' election, uh, Marike Blofield details how labor inspectors became more responsive to domestic workers. And seeing this, seeing that the labor inspectors would take their concerns seriously, domestic workers then started to report more because they saw that there would be zero tolerance for abuses. So their norm perceptions changed because they observed a behavioral change on the part of labor inspectors. So it's this feedback mechanism. So if there is that, so that feedback mechanism can generate a positive feedback loop, overcoming some of the obstacles we mentioned earlier. The importance of transnational networking, also critical. Through seeing center left, well, leftist parties maintain macroeconomic stability and regain uh, and, and be re-elected, uh, shifted people's perceptions about the viability of left-wing parties. People became more hopeful in other countries. Uh, Van Cotten, and Rice and Real Madrid have also highlighted that seeing the success of indigenous parties in Ecuador and, uh, in Ecuador and Bolivia stimulated uh, indigenous movements in other countries to also form indigenous political parties because they saw that people like them could be successful. So it's this sense of observing your peers, both domestically and internationally, within the region, and that can generate hopes. Uh, the Amazonian Indians marched 500 kilometers of resistance across the Andes. By the time they reached Quito in uh, Ecuador, they were 100,000 strong. And again, that was inspired, um, uh, inspired by what was happening elsewhere in the region. Uh, Brazil's landless people's movement also had an uh, inspirational effect. And we know this from ethnographic research, talking and listening to people about you know, their hopes, their dreams, what inspires them. International validity also mattered. So, for example, when the ILO was pushing for international conventions on domestic workers, that showed domestic workers in each of these Latin American countries that, there were, that they had international backing from a sort of recognized international authority. You know, that gave them validity and strength, and they were on the side of the righteous, so to speak. And I think this regional effect, being inspired by their peers, may explain why we see the fall in income inequality in Latin America, but perhaps not elsewhere. I think that might make a difference. The fact that they saw their peers being successful in pushing for more redistribution and more accountable governance. Okay, so, but I want to emphasize the caveat. I don't want to, you know, this is a relatively small fall in inequality and it was contingent upon continued growth, which was itself fragile. Picture of a strike. That's a Brazilian union striking. So, this is what I want to suggest, and I'm really interested in what others think, as a methodology for tackling tricky problems, to learn from long-term process, to learn from long-term, the long durée, to study, you know, 30-year periods of change, and to connect the micro and the macro. You know, we have our own our expert here on expectations and social psychology, but then shift, but then linking that to what's happening with macroeconomics and political science. And I think it's that synergy 
that's really important because the ethnographic data can help us make sense of the broader trends and vice versa. The other big insight, I think, if you buy my interpretations, is that social change accelerates when we see that others are changing. When people see the more responsive governance, when domestic workers see labor inspectors taking their concerns seriously, when people see zero tolerance for abuses, then they're more likely to engage with that governance. So that's how we overcome the chicken and egg problem, by people observing and then expecting more responsive, capable governance. So although a lot of work has been done, you know, NGOs often try to raise awareness, tell people about their human rights. That might not be that effective. We also know that providing information about government budgetary flows, you know, saying how much money is going to a school, that might not be terribly influential if people don't have credible reasons for hope, if they don't think that by mobilizing, by pushing for accountability, then they'll see any kind of redress. So to motivate, to support ongoing social change, we need to provide credible reasons for hope. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you very much, Alice. Uh, okay, we have time for some questions, so let me open the floor up. Come on, you guys are supposed to be on fire. <laughs> oh, yes, Anna. Uh, yeah, be good because I think this is being recorded. <laughs> or, or live streamed or whatever. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for that very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm involved in um, some work on the social contract in Africa. And work on social contract in general in the bank is becoming more prominent. How do you see these conclusions that you're drawing here as relevant for the for work on the social contract? Because what you are talking about is the need for both uh, citizens to mobilize and the government, on the other hand, to be responsive. Would you say that that can be uh, a way of strengthening the social contract in various contexts? Thank you. Yes, sure. Yeah. A very interesting, uh, wide-ranging, impressionistic, uh, sweeping presentation. So congratulations. I mean, I, I think questions would emerge with regard to the convergence of methods where you, and I'm sure you've heard this before, right, where you sort of combine the very broad macro trends with a lot of patterns and data, quantitative data, with sort of, uh, as you, you know, call ethnographic cases, um, which ver are very micro. So I don't know if that's what you mean by the connection of the micro and the macro, it seems to me there are ways to connect these uh, rigorously with, with w which are true to each. And it seems like that's perhaps if we had more time, what you could tell us that maybe you're doing and others are doing. I wonder if you could give us a little bit more about that. And I mean, my own suggestion would be, for example, to do uh, surveys or focused experiments to help generalize from the ethnographic work more systematically. Mm -hmm. I think in the presentation you gave, it's hard for us to evaluate uh, sort of the range of experiences, whereas if we had a constrained universe of them from which to choose, we could understand and, and weigh the, your evidence a little bit more uh, properly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh. Thank you very much for uh, the interesting uh, presentation. Um, how do you contrast this with uh, the development in uh, South Africa, where for 24 years now, there is an ANC-led government that is in power, which is more uh, leaning to, to the left, with uh, the same commodity boom observed, but the inequality is actually increasing in South Africa compared to the past. So how do you uh, reconcile the two? And then broadly in the sub-Saharan Africa, 
inequality is not being reduced, even when we observe that uh, they've experienced a huge commodity uh, boom, but we don't see uh, the same experience that we have shown in uh, uh, Latin America. So what can be learned from Latin America that we, uh, we haven't observed elsewhere? Okay, I think that's a rich uh, menu there, why don't you? Take yeah, absolutely. Time. Thank you so much. Um, so, for first of all, the question on being systematic, I absolutely I think that would be it would be brilliant to do a nationally representative survey that could tap into and try to find representative data for some of these expectations and beliefs. So, I entirely agree that would be wonderful. If the bank would like to fund that, I, I, I'm here. I'm ready. Um, but I should add that I, I apologise if anything seemed crude or sweeping. The the full paper is on world development. I think it was published last month. So, if people want to read it. Um, Please do so. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I totally agree with you. On the social contracts, yeah, I think that's really interesting because the social contracts, as I understand it, is partly about our expectations, you know, what we think the government might do in return. And what I'm suggesting here is that if we want to reduce income inequality, then it's partly about shifting expectations. You know, the government anticipating uh, more demands for accountability, to be more threatened, to feel that they have to do something. So it's partly about shifting their expectations. Now, this is the conundrum, right? So uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, as I understand the data, there's a nice uh, report from UNDP looking at this. I think that income inequality has fallen in, in, in sub-Saharan African countries which have experienced uh, labor-intensive growth through agriculture or through manufacturing. But, less, but income inequality has increased with the commodity boom. And I think that's a real challenge. And for me not being an expert on what's happened in, in sub-Saharan Africa, I would anticipate that we were, that the, the, the best thing to do would be to, one, publicise and show that income inequality has fallen in some African countries, like such as Cote d'Ivoire and many West, West African countries, so to publicise reasons that it can, publicise that it can be reduced, and also to demonstrate that African social movements have been successful. So there's a wonderful book, I don't know if you've seen it, um, by Branch and Mamphili. It's all about Africa, a comparative study of African social movements. So to, to show African, various African uh, social movements and countries about people being successful, showing that their peers, that people like them, can make gains from government. I think that would be the really important thing. Thank you. Thank you for this very stimulating presentation. My question is along the line of the how, for uh, the implication for developing bank like the World Bank. How how can we better catalyze a social movement? We we I mean in, if I look at reflect on my work, we work a lot on accountability, but it's not enough, right? Gov holding a government accountable, but at the same time, in terms of stimulating social movement, we don't have a whole lot of entry point because our client, a government, unlike George Soros, we cannot come in and fund you know, social activists and protest <laughs> groups. So w what is our entry point to yeah. stimulate social movement? No, okay. that's a great question. <laughs> I think that's a great question. So one, I think it's possible to publicize dissent. Oh, am I not loud enough? I have never been told that before. <laughs> Sorry. Mike, shall I press a button? I think, I think there's a mic on. You think I should press it as well? Oh, oh you got your... I, I've got... I'm double mic'd. All right. We're good? Okay, sorry. So, one is by using television to publicise dissent, uh, to show... to either publicise dissent, so, for example, uh, highlighting that strikes, that strikes make... That, st that strikes are enabling games. So using television for that. One is the basic stuff that the bank does anyway that may be helping is just infrastructure. You know, the more that rural people are connected to cities learning about protests. So basic infrastructure, connectivity, electricity, that sort of b b basic structure. But I think maybe also what helps is regional benchmarking through seeing that through seeing subnationals, through, you know, showing data whereby income inequality or responsiveness or accountability has increased in that part of Kenya, for example, may lead other people, may lead other districts or provinces within Kenya 
to be inspired by those possibilities, to see that people like them can make gains, so to demonstrate that their peers are changing both within government and civil society. So not necessarily being, you know, too political, but, but showing that progress can be made. I think that's really important, rather than necessarily providing sort of transparency about government flows. Which, but thank you for your question. I wanted to know if you've done. I wanted to know if you've done any work on one way that I don't think you mentioned of possibly breaking the chicken and egg problem, which is through education, entertainment, or theater for development, participatory theater. What I mean by these things is media that exposes people to new social patterns, exposes people to. Um, new role models, exposes people to new, um, new ways in which society can be organized. And there has been some preliminary work on this, excluding by, by many people at the bank. And I wondered if you knew about this in the part of the world you've studied, Latin America. OK. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. OK. Hi, Alison Shanta. So my question is inspired by the comparison between South Africa and Latin America. Mm. And it leads me to ask you about the politics and economics of the middle of the distribution versus the top and the bottom. Mm. So I've got two aspects to that. The one is, how far can you get in the Latin American narrative with a story that combines demand for more skilled labor, huge expansion in post-secondary education, and that combination increases quantity but reduces elite earnings but sort of lowers, increases earnings of people who'd moved, had been upwardly mobile. So that's a pure, how far does that go independent of the politics? And my second question is, what can you add to us on, this is often about coalitions of change, that if I think of a South African story in the immediate aftermath of 1994, it's elites and the bottom, because there's a very strong poverty-reducing sets of initiatives, but the middle of the distribution is really powerless. And I'm interested if there are any lessons from Latin America on the emergence of coalitions in which the interests and aspirations of the middle move to the center in relation to that. Is this working now? Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you think about uh, formalization of many of these sectors and how it sort of um, plays into this long-term sort of shifting expectations timeline. Um, do you think the formalization of these sectors is sort of a necessary prior, or do you think it's somewhat, uh, could it be a catalyst uh, in terms of uh, mobilizing some of these shifting expectations? Did you mean like formalize, formalizing work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because that my question is how sustainable this model is, right? In a way, elite capture of, as you've noted, the media or even the aspirations of certain movements has led to a control of the potential hope and even to uh, manipulation of it. I mean, we've made all the middle classes believe that they want to achieve, they want all their kids to get university education, to not find jobs and to pay a lot for it. In many cases in Latin America, that is the way, or to aspire to private education versus publicly funded education or other ways. So in a way, how much are we leading to potential aspiration failures mm. and to uh, a system where basically social movements get uh, completely invisibilized uh, and not really gain anything out of this. So as fragile as the commodity boom was, how fragile is a process of change that is based on the hopes of social mobilization that in the current world of overwhelming the information may not lead anywhere? Can I take this for now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely, not sustainable at all. I mean, I think we saw that in Brazil in 2013 that with the PT, aspirations continually raised. And then after the commodity slump, the government couldn't deliver and people were frustrated and they went to the streets. So, and this relates to Brian's question that the middle class was only satisfied where with the middle class was only part of this sort of coalition between the poorest and the middle 
when their incomes were continually growing, when the state was able to redistribute but also increase jobs. So incredibly precarious, not sustainable at all, Inc always contingent upon continued economic growth, delivering successes for the middle, but also the poorest. And if governments aren't able to deliver on that, if they're not able to deliver that performance, then the government either loses power or cracks down, as we've seen in Venezuela, for example. So, yeah, not sustainable at all. Um, right, now the other questions. I think uh, we know that insecurity, informalisation, precarious work makes it much harder for workers to organise. Uh, you know, for example, if a worker is on a three-month contract and they might, then they have to reapply for their same job after three months. That curbs their likelihood to strike, to march against the employer. So formalization in terms of a permanent contract uh, enables mobilization because it reduces the risk of job loss. So I think formalization might be important in that sense. Uh, participatory theater and gender sensitization. Yeah, so one of my favorite studies in the world is called Seeing is Believing. And it's a Ugandan video and they show Ugandan women reporting gender-based violence and their community is believing them and supporting them and doing something about it. So this was a study by IPA. And then they showed this video to Ugandan women. They were then more likely to report it because, and believe that their peers would support them if they reported it. So not telling them gender-based violence is wrong, but shifting their expectations about what their peers would do. So it's a really cool study. So it's fiction. It's just fiction, but it so. it still had the same effect. Yes, so that's great. Yes, that's right. In fact, psychologically, you respond exactly the same way to something that I tell you is fictional and something that I tell you is true, that the mind doesn't <laughs> have two categories for stories. It has just one category. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool. Um, okay, wait. Now, what is it? Yeah, I think those, I think, yeah, I th I'm good. Okay. So just, um, you focus a lot on normatively good social movements because those fit your question. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of normatively bad social movements. How do those countervail the good ones or how do they operate separately? Uh, you don't seem to address those, but they're out there. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. Hello. Why are, I mean, why are we so interested in solving the chicken and egg problem? Why not just let it be? In the sense that, and let me explain what I mean. You know, the, you know this concept of the political opportunity structures, right, in social movement literature. Now, so, so, so a good social movement entrepreneur will, will, will look for those opportunities to make a difference and back off when they think, uh, it doesn't work very well. This also goes back to your point of linking the micro and the macro. Mm. They're, they're strategizing mm. when they're effective. Mm. Yeah? And if that's the case, why do we want to say that it is social movements and not dem democratization when, when they affect work very, very closely together in order to make change happen? So, so I, I'm wondering, maybe I misunderstood what you're saying because you seem to be saying that it's more one thing than another when in fact it could be a lot of things together. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Sorry, I should, I should have revealed my answer to the poll. I thought all three were important, right? So I'm totally with you. That was just for a bit of fun. Um, okay, yeah, let's talk about... Um, it, so the reason I focused on those particular social movements is because I'm trying to understand the fall in income inequality. But I don't want to pretend that some of those social movements were also violent, illiberal in various ways. And if we were looking at other regions of the world, we could also talk about the Hindu right, uh, you know, a violent, uh, illiberal regime. Or we could talk about Nepal and an incredibly violent social movement that did enable gains, uh, you know, a violent civil war enabled a reduction in income inequality. So violence and illiberalism are absolutely part of the social movement story. Sorry, I didn't mean to sanitize it. Well, on that note, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Alice. Please join me in thanking her for a very stimulating question.